red blood cells. So what they do is they take a all-purpose medium, such as tryptocase soy medium, and then um, they wash the red blood cells to remove like antibodies and the liquid portion of the blood. And then while the medium is still hot from the autoclave, um, it's, it's cooled a little bit. Um, so when the red blood cells are added, they won't lice. But we can see the, this beautiful bright red color. Um, the color is provided by the red blood cells and the hemoglobin. And of course, in, in atmospheric air, the hemoglobin is oxygenated, so it's a bright red color. Now with the um, red blood cells, the blood auger becomes an enrichment media. It provides many growth factors, um, amino acids, um, components to make nucleotides, vitamins, that many pathogenic bacteria of humans cannot make for themselves. Now such microbes that have to be supplied with a lot of preformed organic molecules, what we call growth factors, they're called fastidious microbes. And it usually means they have very simple enzyme systems or defective enzyme systems so that they can't make their own amino acids, all their own nucleotides. Um, they have many vitamin requirements. So enrichment media is media that supplies all of these growth factors, all, all of these organic molecules pre-made. And that's what blood auger is. Now, um, if you're working in a medical microbiology lab, say a hospital lab, you almost always will place clinical samples from patients on blood auger because, again, so many human bacterial pathogens are fastidious. The reason they invade us is that we are what? We're this great source of preformed organic molecules, right? Yeah, we're fast food for them, right? Okay, so it does make sense that with clinical samples from patients, that you suspect might be infected with bacterial pathogens, you'd always want to place um, part of the clinical sample on blood auger. Now, in addition to being enrichment media, blood auger is also a differential media. It lets us differentiate between bacteria <clears throat> that cause different kinds of hemolysis, and that's kind of the big topic here. So, <clears throat> in um, when we look at different types of hemolysis, the um, Hemolysis literally means blood lysing, and we're specifically talking about the lysis or breaking open of red blood cells. And um, a general term for substances that microbes make that cause hemolysis, they're called hemolysins. So these are substances which can cause lysis of red blood cells. And it turns out, depending on the hemolysins, different microbes will cause different types of hemolysis. And again, we can use this to help di differentiate different types of bacterial pathogens. So um, the first type of homolo homolysis is called alpha, and I just use a symbol here, alpha homolysis. And this is partial destruction of the red blood cells, partial destruction of their contents. And as a result, we see a greening, a greening of the auger. And this is such a cool um, photograph that Professor Holland downloaded. Um, this represents a blood auger plate upon which three different uh, bacteria are growing. And what they did is that they, um, when they inoculated the plates, they used the symbol of the type of homolysis that the bacterium causes. Isn't that cool? I just love that. Okay, so here we see a alpha hemolytic bacterium. And again, we call it alpha um, because it causes partial lysis of the red blood cells. And we see it as a greening or a darkening of the auger. And this is classic for streptococcus pneumonia, which causes bacterial pneumonia, as the name suggests. It's also classic for many of our oral bacteria, such as streptococcus mutans, which we've discussed causes plaque and dental caries. So streptococcus mutans is an example of an alpha hemolytic bacterium. And then streptococcus pneumonia can cause a partial lysis of the red blood cells resulting in alpha homolysis. Okay. Now, um, on the demo plates, what Val and Carmen did for us is they took throat swabs and um, they divided these blood auger plates in half and they, they streaked half the plate with throat swabs so they're picking up a lot of oral microbes including streptococcus mutans and incubated it. And if you hold them up to the light, you can see Especially on the back of the plate, you can see the darkening that's caused by the alpha homolysis. Okay. Now, the next type of homolysis is described as beta homolysis. 
And this is total lysis of the red blood cells, total destruction of their contents. So if you have really good beta hemolysis, what, what I was taught was that if you had beta hemolytic bacteria growing on blood auger, um, if the beta hemolysis is complete, you could actually read, read text through um, the auger. I mean, it's totally, totally clear, like glass. Okay, so that's beta hemolysis. Now here on this cartoon, not, excuse me, not on the cartoon, but the photograph, it's kind of hard to see. Um, it looks like it's a yellow zone around the, these bacteria that, that are causing beta hemolysis. But again, we actually had this plate, and we had like our lab manual text. We could lay the plate down over the text and be able to read the text through that zone of beta hemolysis. Total destruction, right? And there are some very important beta hemolytic bacterial pathogens. Yeah. Uh, you said the green, the alpha is green, greenish. Greening, the darkening. Blackish black in the back? Um, for the alpha hemolysis? Yeah. Which one? For the alpha hemolysis, it's a greening or darkening of the auger. Okay. Yeah, so we don't have, um, they, they say it's not total lysis of the red blood cells. I think what it is, is that the red blood cells have been partially lysed. They're starting to leak their contents. And I think, I don't understand the chemical reactions, but when the contents of the red blood cells are interacting with other components of the auger, and I'm not sure, maybe with the air, we're getting this greeny, greenish discoloration with the alpha hemolysis. Whereas with beta hemolysis, total lysis of the red blood cells, total destruction of the content. So the auger becomes clear, yeah. And, and I've always thought, you know, wow, if the bacteria can do that to the red blood cells on the auger, what happens when they're growing in me? You know, what kind of, what kind of um, damage can they do to cells? So um, two, um, well actually three beta hemolytic bacteria I'd like you guys to know. I'll, I'll make a little bit more room in our chart here. And this is a term that you often hear in medical circles, you know, beta, beta hemolytic this, beta hemolytic that. Um, our not so good friend Staphylococcus aureus. Usually, um, usually when it's freshly isolated, say from a human or an animal, it very often is beta hemolytic. Now we have a lab strain that Val and Carmen streak for us, and we can see that the lab strain of Staph aureus it's not very beta hemolytic at all. And sometimes this happens as they get passed over and over and over in labs they stop producing some of their virulence factors, like the homolysin. Um, so this isn't a great example of being a homolysis, the lab strain of Staph aureus. But again, very often when freshly isolated from a patient, often Staph aureus will be very beta hemolytic. Now another one that you're likely to encounter out in the real world is Streptococcus pyogenes, the organism that causes strep throat. It too is beta hemolytic. And another one that some of you may be familiar with, and, and um, especially those of you that go in to work in OBGYN, you'll become very familiar with it. Um, the species name, and usually in medical circles they don't use a species name, the species name is Streptococcus agalactia. That's a term that's often used in vet medicine. But in um, human medicine, Streptococcus agalactia is usually referred to as group B strep. Group B strep. This is based on um, antigens and serotyping. There's one type. It's those, it's those fungal spores in the air. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Group B Streptococcus. This is based on serotyping, much as we described with, uh, well, much as we're going to describe with um, our different strains of E. coli. So often in human medical settings, they don't refer to it by the species name, Streptococcus agalactia. They refer to it as a group B strep, or GBS. And the reasons these will be important if you guys are going into OBGYN, or if you're female and um, you want to become pregnant in the future, is sadly they've discovered that um, a percentage of women are colonized with group B strep in the vaginal area. And upon um, delivery, um, a, a vaginal delivery of a baby, the baby can become infected. And some of these strains of group B strep will cause neonatal sepsis and meningitis. And, and um, you know, the, the heartbreak is, is that it can kill newborns. And, 
and um, if it does cause meningitis and the baby survives, it can cause permanent neurological damage. This is kind of an emerging infectious disease um, pathogen back when, um, say like 20, 30 years ago, it, people were just starting to talk about it, first, you know, first started to recognize it. And luckily now, moms that are pregnant, usually they are cultured for it. They'll take vaginal swabs um, prior to delivery and check mom to see if she's carrying group B strep. And they can treat mom with antibiotics um, um, pre-delivery and even during delivery. And they've discovered that greatly, greatly, greatly reduces the chance a baby will get infected. So it is really good to know if you're pregnant, if you are carrying the group B strep. Streptococcus biogenes belongs to a different um, uh, antigenic group. And they, another term for um, the streptococcus biogenes, they belong to a serological group called the group A strep. And again, depending on the medical group that you're working with, um, some of them may refer to streptococcus biogenes as group A streptococcus. Okay, so you get the gas, the group A streptococcus, and the group B streptococcus. So again, just so you guys, when you're in medical set settings, you hear folks talking about group A and group B streptococcus, you, you know, these are two um, important pathogenic members of those two different groups. Okay, and again, um, the Staphylococcus aureus streptococcus biogenes and streptococcus agalactia, these are all beta hemolytic bacterial pathogens. And then the last type of homolysis, I love this, gamma homolysis. Gamma homolysis is no homolysis. So a lot of bacteria don't make homolysins. So when you grow them on blood auger, they don't cause any change in the, in the auger at all. And why the heck they had to call it gamma homolysis when it's no homolysis, I don't know. That just seems silly to me. But there you go, you know. Okay, microbiologists can be silly. Okay. So do know the three different types of um, homolysis. For alpha, make sure you know at least one of the alpha hemolytic bacterial pathogens. And we're going to go ahead and call Streptococcus mutans a pathogen since it causes dental disease, and that's really significant. And then um, I would actually like you to know all three of the beta hemolytic, the beta hemolytic bacterial pathogens. And then do know that gamma homolysis is no homolysis. Um, and just, once again, you guys, the photo that Professor Holland downloaded is dynamite, the alpha, the beta, and you can't even see the gamma down here because there's no, the bacteria are growing, but there's no change in the medium. Okay. Very good. Okay. So that's one, one off of our checklist. Okay. And then um, what we're next going to do is we're going to have you guys go and retrieve the cultures you inoculated last week. And I just want to give you a little heads up. Um, so on the motility media, we're going to discuss your results and how we got some false negative results. Very disappointing. Um, but you can pull those um, tubes out. What is really helpful is to get your test tube racks out. So you can put your tubes out where it's easy to see them. Okay. So you're going to pull your motility auger deeps, and we had them incubating at 37. And then what you want to do is very carefully pull your tubes out of the 30 degrees uh, Celsius incubator. And you'll remember those tubes, we had our regular TSA slant, we had our big butt TSA slants, and we had our TS broths. And you want to... Um, uh, transport those tubes very carefully back to your bench because we don't want to disturb the pattern of um, cell growth in your broth tube. So don't shake them, try not to jiggle them, um, pull them out very gently, very carefully, and bring them back to your bench. And again, you want to set them up gently in your test tube rack so you can see them, and we'll discuss the results there. And then the final thing you want to pull also from the, th um, oh, we did one plate at 30 and one at 37. You want to pull your um, your streak plates, um, Chapter 13, Isolation of Bacteria Using Streak Plates. And we're going to describe, um, hopefully, what you'll you'll see there. Okay, so let's take like five minutes. You guys can pull your tubes. And like we said, just try, be really careful not to bump one another because we don't want to 